Considerado um dos mais originais pensadores contemporâneos nessa área, Amit Goswami também já causou polêmica nos meios acadêmicos e até foi alvo de críticas por suas ideias de estabelecer uma ponte entre a ciência e a espiritualidade. Goswami é apontado como um caso pouco comum de cientista transformado por seu próprio trabalho. Na metade da carreira, questionou a visão materialista da ciência, mudou seu foco de pesquisa e passou a produzir estudos unindo conhecimento de tradições místicas com a exploração científica. Em suas teorias, Goswami procura demonstrar que o universo é matematicamente inconsistente sem a existência de um conjunto superior, no caso, Deus. E considera que com o desenvolvimento dos estudos nesta área, Deus será cada vez mais objeto de ciência e não mais de religião. Aposentado como professor de física da Universidade de Oregon desde 2003, Amit Goswami dedica-se atualmente a fazer palestras pelo mundo e também dá aulas sobre ciência e vida espiritual em entidades e institutos dedicados a estudos religiosos e filosóficos nos Estados Unidos, Portugal e também no Brasil. Para entrevistar o físico indiano Amit Goswami, nós convidamos o jornalista Ulisses Capozoli, que é o editor da Scientific America. Maurício Tufani, jornalista e assessor de comunicação da Unesp, a Universidade Estadual Paulista. E é também jornalista Mirna Grichis, jornalista e colaboradora da revista Época Negócio. Laís Werner, doutora em Física Quântica, professora de Tai Chi Chuan e crítica de arte. Osvaldo Pessoa Júnior, professor de Filosofia da Ciência da Universidade de São Paulo. E a jornalista Mônica Teixeira, diretora de redação do Inovação da Unicamp, Universidade de Campinas, e assessora do Núcleo de Educação da Fundação Padre Anchieta. Temos também a participação do cartunista Paulo Caruso, registrando em seus desenhos os momentos e flagrantes do programa Roda Viva. O Roda Viva é retransmitido e transmitido em todo o país, numa rede nacional de TV, e como o programa de hoje está sendo gravado, não podemos contar com a participação dos telespectadores, como acontece aqui normalmente. Mas você pode sempre mandar sua crítica, sugestão ou comentário através da internet. É só você entrar no nosso site, que é o tvcultura.com.br barra Roda Viva, e mandar aí o seu e-mail. Professor Amit Gonçalves, thank you for coming Roda Viva. It is very good to be here. A minha primeira pergunta, professor Amit, o que é a morte? What is death? Death is the succession of consciousness collapsing quantum possibilities into actual events of experience. That is the technical definition of death. So uh, this is interesting because in quantum physics, all objects are possibilities. So, um, in fact, moment to moment, including our body and brain, moment to moment, we collapse these possibilities into the actual events that we experience as our body, as our brain. When we lose that capacity of converting the possibilities into actual events, we die. But notice what is happening. The possibilities go on. Of course, some of these possibilities are material possibilities. Those possibilities will disintegrate in the sense that the structure will gradually disappear, the memory will gradually disappear, bodies disintegrate. But the, uh, beside the material, we also have subtle components, such as our mind, such as the vital, such as the even beyond the mind and the vital supramental archetypes that we also are. Those bodies are subtle. They don't have any structure. They can continue beyond our death. That's the concept of survival after death. Posso fazer uma primeira questão? Posso. Ulisses Caposotti. Professor, o senhor faz uh, uma interação muito bonita, e eu quero confessar a minha simpatia por ela, entre o monismo idealista e o uh, realismo materialista. De qualquer forma, a revolução científica do século XVII está por trás do realismo materialista. Ela produz telefones, produz carros, produz automóveis, produz a televisão. É muito difícil a gente sensibilizar as pessoas para uma outra perspectiva. Essa, por exemplo, do monismo idealista. 
Quem são, na opinião do senhor, os interlocutores uh, capazes de receber esse novo paradigma e ajudá-lo a ampliar? São pesquisadores científicos, intelectuais? Que tipo de gente é mais sensível a essa outra abordagem? Well, um, this is a good question. My feeling and my experience is actually scientists, the hard scientists have more difficulty with consciousness and the idea that consciousness is the ground of being is a better answer to some of the problems that materialism cannot address. Then uh, scientists are more difficult to understand this than ordinary people. So actually people from all walks of life, business people, engineers actually, medical doctors, psychologists, they have a better time, easier time than physicists and chemists and biologists, the hard scientists. This is uh, to be expected. Because the, you know, as, as Richard Feynman uh, once said, the great physicist, once said that scientists must put themselves into the straitjacket of materialism. Otherwise, we cannot do science. This concept is very deep in the hard scientists. Of course, as soon as you deal with quantum measurement and how quantum possibilities become actual events of experience, you've got to posit consciousness. There's just no way out. This is the only paradox-free explanation interpretation of quantum physics that can be given. So we uh, accept monistic idealism, but we at the same time we find that in its own domain, material philosophy and its consequences are all, all okay. Nothing is negated. So what we have done is expanded our science into new domain of experiences that the old science just cannot address. And, and so everybody really should welcome it instead of being antagonistic to it. Professor, o senhor se tornou muito famoso depois que o filme What a Blip foi feito inspirado no seu livro Universo Autoconsciente. É, eu queria que o senhor me falasse sobre a questão da intenção. Como que a intenção, quer dizer, a colocação que o senhor faz de que o observador é responsável é, pela, pela mudança que acontece na realidade, pelas alterações na realidade, e isso está se transformando num movimento mundial. As pessoas estão começando a usar isso em vários sentidos e até erroneamente. Queria que o senhor comentasse sobre esses filmes, O Segredo e o Quem Somos Nós, que foi o nome brasileiro do filme What a Blip. Como que o senhor vê a intenção? Como que o senhor explica isso? Thank you for this wonderful question. So, intentions are very basic in quantum physics because we have already posited the idea that Consciousness is the ground of being in which quantum possibilities exist and consciousness chooses from these possibilities one facet and that facet becomes actual event of conscious experience. So what is this consciousness? Our common sense says that it is us, our ego, ordinary state of our consciousness and that's where we choose. And many people indeed jumped onto that idea when a physicist coined the phrase, we choose our own reality. Sounds wonderful. So people started choosing motor cars and big houses and started intending that kind of thing. The movie Secret actually um, propagates this even in the year of 2006, 2007. So uh, although the original idea died down in the 70s, it has been revived now. <laughs> so we have that problem. What one has to do is to examine the situation a little bit deeply. It's more subtle. If we say that we choose at the individual ego level, then uh, the paradox arises that suppose there is a dichotomy situation. Let's say a traffic light which has two possibilities, two quantum possibilities, red and green. And you are approaching from one street and your friend is approaching from the perpendicular street. Being busy people, both will one green, but whose choice will count? This paradox, which is called paradox of Wigner's friend, because a Nobel laureate physicist Eugene Wigner first gave us this paradox, this paradox uh, is not easily solvable. Because if you say, well, okay, your choice is the one that counts, you would be called solipsistic. Now that's okay, but your friend will also think the same way, that she is the head honcho of the universe and not you. Paradox is just shifted from who gets to choose 
to who gets to the head honcho of the universe. In this way, this paradox really thwarted all effort to bring consciousness into physics for several decades until Ludwig Vass in Australia, myself in Oregon and Casey Blatt in Rutgers, New Jersey all came up with the same solution which is very strange, very uncommon sense and very mystical. Which is the idea that choice happens at the level of a non-ordinary state of consciousness or cosmic unity where all of us are interconnected. This interconnection of consciousness, or consciousness being an interconnectedness that transcends space and time and does not require connection through signals, is new and only quantum physics has it. This concept cannot be generated through any kind of Newtonian physics or any kind of extension of Newtonian physics. It's radically new, it's called quantum non-locality. So consciousness is non-local. This is what is lacking in the common sense expectation that we, in our ordinary local identity with the brain, can change a possibility into actual event and therefore can choose profitable things for us. We can't, unfortunately. Dr. Namit, is it possible to measure this phenomenon of which you are talking about? Because physics is about measuring, isn't it? Thank you for the question. Yes, this is then a consequence of the theory that consciousness is the ground of being and it chooses out of quantum possibilities the actual event of experience. That consciousness then has to be non-local. We have to have a non-local interconnectedness. Yes, sir. So therefore two people should be able to communicate non-locally without exchanging signal. Now, uh, it should also be to make it credible, it better be a brain phenomenon that gets transferred to another brain. And indeed, this was what was verified by Jacobo Ginberg, a neurophysiologist at the University of Mexico, who let two people meditate together with the intention that they communicate directly without signals. And uh, they were indeed, after a brief, brief meditation period, they were separated, put in separate Faraday cages, electromagnetically impervious chambers. Their brains were connected with EEG machines, electroencephalogram. And then one subject, and only one subject was shown, a series of light flashes. So this subject's brain has all kinds of electrical activity in response to the light flashes. And this activity electric was measured? And then that could be measured in the EEG machine connected to the brain? What is normally called brain wave. And from that, an evoked potential is extracted. What is amazing, and defies any kind of local common sense explanation is that the other subject who does not see any light flashes, other subjects EEG connected to the other subject's brain also shows a potential which is virtually the same in intensity, in strength, and even the phase overlap is fully 71% in one particular case, 75% in another case, 67% in another case. In other words, it's substantial, always. So what uh, is then the consequence, the, co the conclusion of the experiment is that the electrical activity from a brain is being transferred to another brain without any electrical connection or contact. E há outras, há outras medidas eh, desse fenômeno? Há outros cientistas trabalhando nisso, Dr. Lennart? So, after Jacobo Greenberg did this at the University of Mexico in 1993-94, uh, Peter Fennick verified the same thing with slightly different arrangement in his laboratory in London. And then, since then, two other experiments, one was by Wackerman, I don't know the details of this experiment, but the, another one uh, by Liana Standish and her group at Bastyr University in Seattle verified the same thing. So now four independent experiments have shown that yes, brain-to-brain -brain information transfer without any electromagnetic connection is possible, is measured, and therefore non-locality of consciousness because only way you can explain this is there is a non-local connection. Connection to what? Obviously, it has to be consciousness because only consciousness can choose out of brain possibilities the actual event in the second observer's brain, which is similar to the first observer's experience. Em relação, eu só queria 
Eu, ah. eu tenho encontrado, eu, eu imagino que essas ideias estejam enfrentando uma certa dificuldade com relação ao conservadorismo de grande parte da comunidade científica. Eu acho muito importante que haja debates sobre diferentes concepções da ciência, mas não me parece que esteja havendo um debate efetivo sobre esse tipo de ideias. É, eu, por exemplo, eu puxei, fiz um levantamento sobre seus trabalhos no Web of Science, que é um banco de dados do Instituto para a Informação Científica, sediado em Filadélfia, nos Estados Unidos. Ele aponta 21 trabalhos indexados, né, publicados pelo senhor. Até 1986, né, janeiro de 86, o senhor teve uma, uma atuação científica assim, bem, bem tradicional, assim, bem convencional. Né, e de lá para cá o senhor publicou nove artigos né, sobre esses temas. Doze artigos, perdão. Ah, não, nove. E esses nove artigos, eles tiveram apenas 46 citações em todo o mundo, muitas deles citações do senhor próprio e de pessoas que são ligadas ao senhor. Quer dizer, enfim, não se trata de um assunto com repercussão na comunidade científica. A gente não vê um debate. E, e me parece que, lendo os seus livros, que os pontos que seriam polêmicos não são devidamente assim explorados em seus livros. A ciência ela, ela evolui em função de debates, em função de controvérsias, né? mas examinando assim detalhadamente suas obras, a gente, dá para perceber que apesar de suas teses heterodoxas, que pontos polêmicos como, por exemplo, o Einstein, o senhor cita muito o Einstein, mas o Einstein é um homem que gastou as três últimas décadas, foi um homem que gastou as três últimas décadas de sua vida combatendo a mecânica quântica. E isso baseado numa compreensão que ele tinha do universo e de Deus particularmente. Né? E esse é um ponto que o senhor não, não explora muito, assim como tantos outros. Isso não incomoda o senhor, o fato de não, não haver esse devido confronto de ideias né? na, na sua obra? Eu aprecio a pergunta. Infelizmente, a confrontação não é o estilo que é recomendado pelo mundo de vista que eu tenho, e o mundo de vista que explica a quantum física. And that now seems to explain many unexplained phenomena that cannot even be addressed with the materialist worldview. This is a very friendly approach. It's a very inclusive approach. I don't think getting into heated debate with specific scientists will do anything to our cause of changing the paradigm. The paradigm will change by the weight of evidence in favor of it. Right now, what is helping enormously is that We have gotten applications in the field of medicine. We have gotten applications in the field of psychology. Um, unfortunately, I don't think you have looked at the, how many times my uh, work is referred to in the work of psychologists and medicine people and um, others who are not the hard scientists. Yes, it is true that physicists and chemists the, um, and even the biologists, the hard scientists, prefer to offer what is called benign neglect. They don't engage with this issue because engaging will give me more publicity and they consider that detrimental to their cause. So let them live their way, let us live our way is right now the best approach. Alternative science. We are developing an alternative science paradigm. We are developing alternative answers to questions that normal science, materialist science cannot address. We are giving people viable answers such as the validity of alternative medicine, validity of transpersonal psychology, validity of spirituality and yoga. Let this use this be commonplace among people. Let it serve people. Science ultimately serves people. If people are served, there will be grassroots movement from the people themselves. That what is going on here? Which science do we prefer? Which science is serving us in our everyday life? And which science is just more and more dealing with esoteric questions such as how many angels can dance on a pin? This is what much of elementary particle physics is about. Who cares what happens at very, very, very high energies that we seldom see even in the totality of the universe, except for the first few micro, micro, microseconds of the universe? But we spend more time and money on those questions than we spend about how to heal ourselves when we have an incurable cancer. These are the questions that the new science can deal with. And this is much more important to pay the attention to answer questions that are important for people rather than get into vain debates with other scientists. They are just individual people. They have their prejudices. 
as similarly I have my prejudices. Science is not best done that way. You develop theories, theories are put to test, laboratory experiments such as the one I described, those things speak for the new science much, much more. And the evidence is now piling up like anything. We have new theories of evolution that works, that explains fossil gaps. We have quantum healing, the phenomenon that the geographers described. There is enormous evidence that quantum healing, quantum leaps occur where consciousness chooses health rather than death. Dr. Amit já publicou vários artigos e livros, inclusive aqui no Brasil. Sobre suas teorias, que se buscam um ponto de união entre ciência e espiritualidade, ele está respondendo hoje aqui no nosso Roda Vida. O universo autoconsciente. A janela visionária. O médico quântico. A física da alma. No primeiro, que Amit Goswami publicou no Brasil, ele contraria a ideia de que tudo é feito de matéria, e estabelece uma nova visão de mundo, onde a consciência, e não a matéria, é a base de tudo o que existe. Em sua janela visionária, defende um novo paradigma científico, onde os valores humanos vêm em primeiro lugar. Como médico quântico, traz as orientações de um físico para a saúde e a cura. E na física da alma, traça uma explicação científica para a reencarnação, a imortalidade e as experiências de quase-morte. Questões que Amit Goswami também levou ao cinema. Junto com outros nomes da ciência, falou de suas ideias no filme Quem Somos Nós, que teve uma segunda parte depois. Quem Somos Nós? Uma nova evolução. Os dois filmes misturam ficção e documentário e procuram mostrar que a realidade, da forma como é percebida pelas pessoas em geral, é ilusória. Goswami diz que realidade... É algo que nós mesmos criamos e, portanto, podemos mudar. Os filmes foram um sucesso de bilheteria nos Estados Unidos e Canadá. Também ganharam versão em DVD e foram distribuídos por quase todo o mundo, inclusive no Brasil. Doutor Ahmed, a alma humana tem consciência? This is a rather subtle question. Yes, human soul uh, has consciousness. It depends on what you mean by the soul. Let's, uh, let's get that clear. I assume that human, you mean by the soul the surviving entity after death. Is that true? Is that what you mean? If, if that is the case, then uh, after death, possibilities do not collapse into actual events anymore. So what happens is that uh, everything goes into what we call unconscious, at the level of possibility. Yes, consciousness is there and possibility is there, but there is no ongoing conversion of the possibilities into actual events. So is this all conscious? Yes, certainly, consciousness is there. But soul is just a possibility or a bundle of possibilities within consciousness. E quais são as manifestações físicas é, da alma, ou então disso que o senhor disse na, na resposta da primeira pergunta do Heródoto a respeito da morte, que é essa perenização de interações quânticas após a cessação da, da consciência? Quais são as medidas físicas? Porque eu vou insistir, é, a física é sobre medir fenômenos, né? Yes. So, uh, how could we find a measurement phenomenon that verifies that, yes, there is survival of possibilities? So, let me finish the uh, theory. The theory says okay. not only possibilities survive, but a certain way of modification of the possibilities also survive. These modifications happen because when we live our day-to-day -day life, our memories that are gathered in the brain. Brain is coupled to how the mind works, one of the components of the subtle body. So mind, the way mind functions is modified. This is how we develop an individual character, an individuality. And it is this modifications of the mind, modification of the mind and subtle body as a whole, that then survives the death. So if we can show that yes, so indeed, there are people who are called mediums, who have the capacity to channel these entities 
discarnate entities, these souls, so to speak. And when they do that, their character undergoes a radical change. Gilda Mura, one of the Brazilian uh, <coughs> researchers, and Norman Don, an American researcher, did an experiment in which they showed that one of the uh, people who were uh, channeling a doctor, a surgeon, Dr. Fritz, his name was, this channeler, when he channeled Dr. Fritz, his frequency of operation, better frequency, went up over 40 hertz. That kind of frequency is used only by people of extreme degree of concentration, such as a neurosurgeon, maybe a quantum physicist, <coughs> scientist in general, but definitely not by a lay person like this channeler was. And indeed, they measured and measured and measured this channeler normally never operated at that kind of high frequency beta. So the physiological characteristics change. And of course, the mental characteristic change also. I myself have verified that working with, with uh, channelers. When they channel the entity, they're totally different mm -hmm. than their ordinary uh, way that they live. E esse tipo de resultado que o senhor está dizendo, é, ele não nunca interessou a, a governos ou talvez a indústria bélica no sentido de poder ser utilizado e, e transformado em objetos vamos dizer, úteis, seja para a guerra, seja para a vida cotidiana? Well, uh, the, ch the channelers uh, apparently have been very much useful in everyday life of people, people who are otherwise, would have been otherwise quite miserable. Apparently, these uh, channelers are great healers. There is right now a channeler. Uh, I, I just uh, wrote a, a forward for a book, wonderful book about a, a channeler named John of God. Which is, who is also known as Medium Joao, uh -huh. lives in Brazil, not very far from here. Uh -huh. And this fellow, uh, he channels such loving entity, not one entity, but several entities, souls, quantum monads in my language. And he performs wonderful healing while he channels this very loving entity. People feel the love, uh -huh. and people get actually healed. And mas, thousands upon thousands of people are getting healed in their everyday life. Não, mas não é disso que eu estou falando. Não foi essa a pergunta que eu fiz. O que eu fiz é se esse tipo de fenômeno não interessou, vamos dizer, é, a, 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 aos governos mesmo e à indústria de maneira geral, no sentido de transformá-la em alguma coisa que pudesse, por exemplo, dar dinheiro. O senhor acha que por que, que não há esse interesse? Quer dizer, esse, esse, essas, essas forças, essas energias, essas mudanças de, de, de frequência é, não teriam utilidade tecnológica? Esse é que é meu ponto. Well, you have to give it time. You have to give it time because, uh, remember, uh, thermodynamics was discovered for quite some time before James Watt and others Sim, produced the steam engine and so forth. So, look, uh, physics of the soul, physica da alma in, in Brazil, it was written at 2001. Just six years have elapsed. We have to wait for a few decades. The reason is the inertia right now of normal science, materialist science, is a huge inertia. There's a lot of grant money involved. If they have to share the grant money with what they consider cooks and, and uh, crazy people, uh, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of time to change the mindset. But it is also, let me point out that before our new paradigm came through, before this, there was not even any grant authority that gave any money even to alternative medicine. But now in America, the traditional government, federal government level, have a separate funding agency for alternative medicine. So we are making breakthroughs. It's not true that we have not made any breakthrough. But for such radical things as taking advantage of channelers and channeled entities, that will require a bit more patience. People are, by the way, already using uh, paranormal. Now, for example, people who want to search treasure uh, under the sea. There are many, many such treasure incidents from the olden days, and they don't know where it is. The ocean is very vast. So they ask uh, clairvoyants, 
psychic people to uh, look for these treasures. And the success rate is enormous. Another example is dowsers. Dowsing works on alternative science principle. There is no material explanation. It works on the principle that we are sensitive to the vital energy that is with the water. People use dowsers routinely. Anybody who is making a big house and big investment and has to have water on the property and where to dig. So they get a dowser and dowser finds uh, the place where to dig. And the success rate is enormous. So these are some of the applications that is already taking place. Dr. Amit, the professor Oswald has also a question to you. Please, Oswald. Professor Goswami. A sua teoria da consciência quântica é uma teoria filosófica, não exatamente científica. É, é, ela se baseia na teoria quântica, mas a teoria quântica ah, não tem as consequências que a sua teoria tem. Ah, você afirma que é possível uma pessoa com a sua vontade... <coughs> fazer com que um experimento quântico tenha um resultado tendendo para um lado. Mas isso não é consequência da teoria quântica. Né? A teoria quântica você pode escolher o observável que você quer medir, mas não influenciar o resultado da medição. Mas a sua teoria afirma que isso é possível. Então, a sua teoria não é uma consequência da teoria quântica. Ela afirma algo a mais. You have, to be, you have to be a little bit more subtle. What you said is not quite right. First of all, all theories, if they are not mathematical, cannot be denied that they are theories. Philosophy is also theory. For example, in biology and psychology, there is no mathematical theory. Darwin's theory is not a mathematical theory. So do we say that Darwin's theory is not a theory of science? We don't. So just because my theory is not mathematical, don't say that it is philosophy. It is also theory. Why is it theory? theory the difference between theory and philosophy, sorry I'm giving you a uh, short lesson, but uh, the difference of theory and philosophy should be very clear. A philosophical idea need not have any experimentally verifiable consequence. A theoretical idea of science, on the other hand, must have, must have an experimentally verifiable consequence. It must be able to guide future research. My work passes this test in flying colors. There is a prediction, I already have told you that the prediction has verified by four different independent experiments, and it has guided the work of transpersonal psychologists, work of alternative healing, uh, working on evolution, not only mine, but other people too. Nice. So it is already guiding research in science, for which this idea of individual choice is meaningful. It is true what you say about physics and chemistry. When you work with many, many particles and many, many events, all we need is probabilities and quantum mathematics calculate those probabilities very well. One does not have to address the quantum measurement in a single measurement. That issue does not even arise for ordinary experiments that verify quantum physics in the laboratory. So as far as physics and chemistry is concerned, there is hardly any application of these ideas. But for biological systems, for living systems, we are forced to think of single objects and single events. It is for this situations. A single object, a patient who has to heal himself or herself by intention. Single object and single event. There you have no way that you can apply probabilistic quantum physics. You don't have a million patients with million events to look at. You have one single patient with a single intention and a single event. Will she be healed or not? In these cases, only this approach that I'm taking is applicable. And this approach is passing the test because we now have many cases of quantum healing that a person can intend herself or himself to help if intention is made in the proper spirit. In other words, if the intention resonates with the intention of that cosmic consciousness which makes the choice, then individual intentions are rewarded.
Laís, por favor. Por favor. Sinceramente. Eu acho que é difícil, até para os mais céticos, né, negarem um certo paralelismo entre as interpretações que se pode fazer da teoria quântica e o que dizem as tradições espirituais, particularmente as do Oriente, né, como o Budismo, o Vedanta, o Taoísmo. Né. Do Taoísmo, o Niles Bohr tomou emprestado para gravar em seu brasão o símbolo yin yang do tai chi, com a inscrição em latim, os opostos são complementares. Isso para representar o princípio básico da física quântica, que é o princípio da complementaridade da autoria do Bohr. Né? Agora, o curioso nesse símbolo é que ele é bem mais complexo do que ele aparenta na sua simplicidade. Né? E considerando os seus níveis de significação, os seus elementos, ele vai fundo ao princípio da complementaridade. Né? E apresenta as características de complementaridade que, surpreendentemente, são muito próximas da interpretação idealista da teoria quântica pelo Amit Goswami. Não sei se já se deu conta disso. E, entre outros detalhes, ele simboliza com o um ponto branco e an, né, no preto in e vice-versa, uma dinâmica cíclica autorreferente que leva à unidade por um agente oculto, transcendente, que é o tal, né, que contém o manifesto, o não manifesto e é ainda agente causal, que realmente corresponde a lógica da hierarquia entrelaçada né? e o nível inviolado da consciência una, não local, na linguagem da interpretação quântica de Goswami. Eu me pergunto se já deu conta disso, se tomou conhecimento do significado desse símbolo até as suas últimas consequências e se o Bohr teria vislumbrado essa interpretação idealista, uma vez que ele esteve na China em 1937, depois de terminado todo o seu trabalho, né, e ficou muito impressionado com a complementaridade em Yang. E, voltando, ele passou a estudar, né, a se interessar muito pela cultura oriental. Dez anos depois, é que ele colocou o símbolo no brasão. Não teria Bohr, com toda a sua perspicácia, com todo o seu conhecimento, com a sua grande criatividade, teria visto, teria aparecido talvez nos seus escritos tardios algum indício de, dessa percepção da sua teoria, da, 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 dessa interpretação idealista, a, da teoria quântica? I think all of the, thank you for the question, this is, this is great history to remember. I think all of the quantum physicists mm. of that era, the major one, were made definitely Werner Heisenberg, Erwin Schrodinger, Einstein himself, whom we have already mentioned. It is not widely known that Einstein himself discovered quantum non-locality, the idea that quantum physics contains this peculiar concept of non-locality, which is why he couldn't accept it, because it seems to go against the grain of relativity theory. Only now we can see that it bypasses relativity, because what it is saying is that signalless communication should occur outside of space and time. But uh, in Einstein's time, we couldn't conceive of the universe having a component that is outside of space and time. But Heisenberg already talked about the domain of potential, which is outside of space and time. Einstein just couldn't, couldn't grasp it at that time and could not believe in quantum non-locality. Now, quantum non-locality is verified in the physics laboratory in 1982. And of course, for the humans that I already described in 1993-94. So it is then experiments that uh, made all this quantum magic come to life before that, it would have been very difficult for these people, although they suspected that philosophy of physics 
is due for a very great paradigm shift. They all suspected it. Schrodinger even declared, I am this whole world, cosmic consciousness, but not in connection with his work. What is his work? His work brought, brought down to the paradox of Schrodinger's cat, which he never could himself solve. Mm -hmm. Only von Neumann recognized that, yes, consciousness is the solution, but he could not rise above a dualistic theory of consciousness. He, could, he was not radical enough to recognize that consciousness is the ground of being. Eugene Bigner, another Nobel laureate, suspected the same thing, that consciousness is important, but again could not be radical enough, could not go far enough, which is to recognize that consciousness is cosmic, not individual. So he raised the paradox, also got bogged down in his own paradox, could not solve it. But you see the struggle these people are going through. They are the people who recognize that a radical shift of philosophy, a radical shift of the way of doing science, is coming. The people who picked up their attitude are people like John Bell, people like Alan Aspey who verified quantum non-locality, and people like myself, Andy Stapp, Fred Allen Wolf, who are actually involved. Ludwig Vass I have already mentioned, Casey Blatt I have already mentioned, and uh, these are the people who picked up that same spirit. But thank you for reminding us that the originators of quantum physics knew the radical nature of quantum physics. Nós temos aqui a pergunta do professor titular do Departamento de Teologia e Ciências da região da PUC de São Paulo, que é o professor Mário Sérgio Cortella. Ele tem aqui uma questão. Vamos ver a questão. Em março de 2001, eu tive a chance de perguntar ao senhor o entrecruzamento de duas grandes indagações, a possibilidade de viagem no tempo e a origem do universo. E naquele momento se falava da possibilidade de, não sendo o tempo linear, um recuo na nossa trajetória. Hoje eu gostaria de completar essa questão com uma curiosidade. Na hipótese, não sendo o tempo linear, de nós voltarmos no tempo, seja uma pessoa, seja um artefato humano, e que nós recuemos até o momento originário do universo, o Big Bang ou outra explicação, o que é que o senhor supõe que nós vamos lá encontrar? Uma força uma consciência, uma pessoa, um fenômeno físico? Qual é a expectativa que o senhor tem em relação à razão daquele momento inicial no instante em que ele acontece? O que é que será por nós achado? Isto é, qual é a razão, de fato, dessa no nossa origem na tua expectativa? Não necessariamente na prova científica, mas no teu desejo ou, como disse, na tua expectativa e esperança. Uh, professor, to the uh, contrary, it is actually a very scientific question. In fact, sometimes it is raised as a paradox, because if uh, everything is possibility, just as Big Bang must have been, in fact, Stephen Hawking's theory, quantum cosmology posits that the universe must begin as wave universes of possibilities. So what then converts these possible universes into the actual universe that we live in what chooses it, and so forth. Those questions are questions of the same quantum measurement problem that we have been considering here. If you say consciousness does, then the question comes in, well, there is no conscious, conscious being in the time of Big Bang. It's too hot anyway. No being could survive. No alive being could survive. So it is a legitimate paradoxical question. Fortunately, in quantum physics, even before this kind of questions were uh, raised, People did an experiment which is called, called delayed choice experiment. This is a very interesting experiment because it shows that even if we choose with a delay of what according to classical physics would suggest things are already happening, but uh, things don't happen that way in quantum. In quantum physics, things wait in possibility until a conscious being has actually looked. This is only possible in quantum physics. Classical thinking will get you nowhere. So what happens then, the construction is that the universe waits in possibility, along with Big Bang, creation of galaxies, creation of stars, the, um, the planets, and enough solidification of the planet, creation of the atmosphere, all of that waits in possibility until the first living creature, that one cell 
That happened something like four billion years ago on Earth or other planets too, it's quite possible. But until that one living cell completes what John Wheeler used to call the meaning circuit, completes this what I call the tangled hierarchical circuit where quantum measurement takes place, the circularity, because observer is needed for collapse of a quantum event. On the other hand, collapse is needed for creating the observer. This is a circular logic, a tangled hierarchical logic that applies to all such creation events. So until that happens, until that meaning circuit is complete, there is no collapse, there is no Big Bang. How does Big Bang happen then? Big Bang happened going backward in time from that collapse event all the way to the origin 15 billion years ago. So Big Bang exists where? Did Big Bang ever happen? Big Bang happened only figuratively speaking, in our memories. So how do we know that Big Bang happened? Of course, memories of Big Bang event, namely cosmic microwave radiation, that can be observed, and that is what we observe. We uh, have to reconstruct events like this in terms of quantum physics. When you do that, then there is no paradox anymore. Ulisses, por favor. Ulisses, uma pergunta para fazer, por favor. Eu queria voltar a essa questão controvertida, evidentemente, que é a da morte. O senhor fala nos seus livros, professor, do livro tibetano dos mortos. Todo aquele conhecimento do livro tibetano dos mortos, até onde eu sei, tem sido, ao menos parcialmente, corroborado com as experiências de quase-morte, EQM. A construção de todo o conhecimento do livro tibetano dos mortos não, não foi feita à base de medida ou de peso. Eu pergunto, inclusive, se é possível, se faz sentido a gente pensar na nona sinfonia ou na pietá, medindo e pesando. Eu, evidentemente, que são coisas da criatividade humana. O peso e a medida tem muito a ver com o realismo uh, materialista. A sua proposição, eu acho que é numa outra direção. Uh, o que do livro tibetano dos mortos tem sido corroborado por essas abordagens que o senhor tem feito na área de mecânica quântica? Aquilo tudo era besteira ou nós temos uma estética, temos uma construção que faz sentido? Well, it, it turns out that when you reconstruct the soul in the way that I already suggested, that namely the character of a person that survives the death and the character stays in the mathematics that is involved with producing that character, and if a person in the future uses the same mathematics, then that person could be called a reincarnation of this person who is dying. So if you construct even this way, then indeed you can, you can construct a whole pathway. This delayed choice experiment that I just mentioned is very useful. So after death, possibilities cannot collapse. There is no actual event. There you are completely right. But at the moment of the birth of the following incarnation, there will be a collapse event. In that collapse event, the entire pathway of events that Tibetan Book of the Dead describes, that entire pathway of events will take place. Did they actually take place? We cannot say, because only memories of that, just as the Big Bang only shows in its memories, we never really can ever verify Big Bang. Only memories will show. Similarly, just memories will stay. Memories will stay where? In the newborn baby's memory. So can we ever retrieve it? It turns out that psychologists, very powerful psychologists like Stan Graf, they have devised methods. Stan Graf's method is called holotropic breathing. A very intense way of breathing that takes people in altered states of consciousness in which they can regress. They can regress even to the birth canal. It's amazing. And in that regress state, they are told to make statements and they make statements as they remember them. And in these statements, indeed, people remember what might have happened during that journey across death towards another life. And they say things like, I chose my parents, I chose sex, my sex, I chose uh, what, what I'm going to do with this life. Uh, so that suggests that, indeed, uh, it, it's verifiable. If what happens during that sojourn through uh, outside of space and time is not completely unverifiable, although we have to be very patient, work with many, many subjects and many, many events to construct the specific answers to Tibetan Book of the Dead. Okay. O senhor acha que o fato do senhor ter nascido na Índia, com toda essa 
profunda e ampla tradição da Índia, facilita um pouco a exploração desse território todo que o senhor trabalha, em comparação a nós, por exemplo, que não temos essa base filosófica? Eu acho que eu poderia dizer isso. Eu estava muito perdido por isso. Para dizer a verdade, em 2014, eu me tornei um completo materialista. That materialism never went away until an experience that I had while I was talking with a mystic light dawned in, in me that yes, consciousness is the ground of being, could be a way to extend science to arena that science has not dealt with. But before that revolution, I was quite materialist. In fact, even after that revolution, I'll tell you very frankly, in 1994, after Self Aware Universe came out, I was on a talk show, radio talk show, and the question was asked, <laughs> what happens when you die? And I was totally dumbfounded. I did not know how to answer it. I did not want to deal with the question of death, and I did not want to deal with reincarnation. These things were unheard of, unbelievable in a physicist vocabulary, in a physicist thinking process. A series of events took place that took me into the uh, uh, researching of the physics of the soul. Like I, I, I had a dream. In the dream, I heard the words, Tibetan Book of the Dead is correct, it's your job to prove it. Things like that took place. And, and because of it, here I am, having a uh, well-defined, well-researched subject like physics of the soul. But I was a materialist. There's no way that we can grow up in this culture and do physics, which I did with gusto for many years, uh, without becoming a materialist. Professor Gosvan, I would like to return a questão levantada pela Mirna sobre os dois filmes, o Quem Somos Nós e o Segredo. O que me incomoda muito no argumento desses dois filmes é justamente o que os fez ser amplamente comemorados e aplaudidos pelos entusiastas de um novo tipo de estratégia de comunicação voltada para o convencimento em grande escala, que é o chamado marketing viral viral marketing, que consiste em trabalhar agressivamente com mensagens aglutinadoras de crenças amplamente disseminadas, deixando de lado tudo que poderia entrar em contradição com elas. E isso tem muito a pouco a ver com debate e tem muito pouco a ver também com divulgação séria, deixar né, essas coisas de lado. E certamente os filmes devem estar dando muito lucro né, para quem os elaborou, né? enfim caindo em outro lado do materialismo, né? Uh, isso não incomoda o senhor, essa, esse vínculo, né? Well, isn't every movie made with some kind of message to give? And consider how many more movies give you the materialist message. We forget that often time. To any spiritual teacher that uh, we question, we don't realize that thousands upon thousands of people are teaching us constantly unfounded materialist beliefs. I saw in, a, in, a, in the first grade, work of a school, I saw the statement, everything is made of matter. Now show me where the proof is that everything is made of matter. It's, it has never been proven that mind is made of matter, never has been proven that consciousness is made of matter. These are wild theories of materialist ilk, and we accept those things without even questioning. Richard Feynman in his book wrote, everything is made of matter without an iota of proof. Yes, every material thing is made of matter, every material experience is made of matter, but nobody has ever shown for mental experience or vital experience of feeling or intuition that is made of matter. So uh, you have to be very careful here. Okay, these movies are not necessarily even agreeing with the message, complete message of quantum physics as I see it. So the secret particularly is faulty because it says there is this, this attractor, attraction, and uh, you can attract a particular desire towards you if you just sit and wait for it. That's not the way I see things can be attracted. Yes, things can be attracted, but you have to intend properly. You have to remember that intention must resonate with cosmic consciousness, and you have to be creative about it. So you cannot just do nothing and still expect that things will come to you. Yes, creativity does come to us, but only if we go through both work and waiting, both work and relaxation. Now that is well known. Now this thing, uh, materialist science would never tell you that relaxation is necessary for a creative experience. But research has shown us that relaxation is necessary. You think in quantum terms, 
easily understandable. Why? Because quantum possibilities expand when we are not collapsing them. And more expanded the quantum possibilities are, the more possibility you have to choose from, obviously then creativity will be enhanced. This was the idea of what he believed. These movie makers surprised me. I tell you, they just asked me that, well, would you be interviewed? I just gave an interview with my ideas. That's all I did. That all the role that I played in the movie. These movie makers put the story together, a story of a creative young woman who discovered creativity, by the way. It's a beautiful story, told with honest symbology, such provocative symbology, that we should only praise this movie. Okay, you may not agree with the idea of some of our physicists and neurophysiologists who appeared in the movie. In fact, some of the people, some of the scientists who appeared in the movie did not agree with the message of the movie, or did not agree with other scientists' opinions. This is to be expected. That is fine. It's a paradigm in building. We don't agree with each other always, and we don't expect everybody to agree with us right away. As I said, theory must be backed up by experimental data. But how can you deny that, that these movies are a good experiment? If they promote many other movies with this kind of technique that scientists speak in the background, where the story unfolds, all power be to them. There are so many other stuff that is being produced. Isn't that the, what we mean by creativity, something new? You cannot deny that these movies touched a chord with many people because they explored some new ideas with which people resonate. Dr. Amit, we have another question for the Mr. Amit. Professor Amit, se nós considerarmos que as empresas são seres vivos, porque são formados por pessoas, e que até hoje nós partimos os processos de gestão, de liderança e de criatividade a, a partir de uma visão clássica e cartesiana, a minha pergunta é, de que maneira que a visão quântica pode ser útil para as empresas e que exemplos, eventualmente, nós podemos seguir se é que as empresas já estão disseminando essa nova visão para a quebra de paradigmas? I am glad that I have been given the opportunity to address this issue. This is the passion of my present current research. Since we have discovered that there is a way, namely this new paradigm, consciousness is the ground of being. Since we have discovered that there is a way of putting consciousness back in science, there is a way of introducing subtle bodies, namely mind, vital energies, feeling and intuition in the equation for our science then we must use these subtle bodies to uh, influence this idea of consciousness and downward causation, conscious choice to influence all the human enterprises that are important to us, that play an important role in our day-to-day -day life, especially business and economics. As you know, economics is an extremely imperfect science. Uh, the academic economists made a very, very bad choice of making economics mathematical. It became the economics of an ideal world that is actually uh, cannot possibly be true in the real world where business people have their emotions, feelings, have their intuitions, and uh, even thought is not always rational as we know. It's, it's influenced by uh, emotions and intuitions. So uh, this has not been taken into account in academic economics. So I'm proposing that we change economics. Capitalism itself is a very good idea, completely conducive to the idea of consciousness. In fact, capitalism made meaning processing available to a lot more people than it was available before capitalism came along. So capitalism is completely consistent with the evolution of consciousness. But what we have done to capitalism since then is not very consistent with the idea of meaning processing for all people, the idealist idea. Where, we have, uh, where have we gone wrong? Of course, we can also see that even Adam Smith's capitalism has some crucial flaws in it. The business cycle, the boom and bust. People cannot live with boom and bust because bust hurts people. So what is the solution to that? All the solutions we have proposed so far, to a main principal one being Keynesian economics, which puts money in people's pocket in terms of government jobs and then consumers uh, recover the economy, or the supply side where you put 
money supply into the pockets of rich people, but demand is not affected, so inflation is not produced. These ideas have worked to some extent, no denying that, but the boom and bust cycle is still not eliminated. What I have suggested is that if we introduce the subtle bodies, if we introduce subtle bodies as a component of the economy, production and consumption, you produce subtle energies, such as vital energies, actively. Can it be produced? Yes, it can be produced. There are people, as Abraham Maslow's research showed a long time ago, who live in constant, wonderful, positive energies of love and so forth. Therefore, these people could be part of businesses. These people could be employed by government. These people could be a segment of the economy during the time of recession. This would absorb the cushion that we need for businesses to recover. Because it is a fact that if people are satisfied, then their material needs are reduced. Dr. Amit, the senhor disse agora há pouco que era materialista e deixou de ser materialista. Agora o senhor acredita em Deus? A física quântica é capaz de explicar a existência de Deus? Yes, I believe in God, but you have to qualify this statement, and I must. Because materialists constantly attack a populist picture of God, and it is not that picture of God that new science is supporting. The populist picture of God is as a human being, some kind of a being, may not be human, a superhuman being, an emperor-like being, who somehow makes judgment on people when they die or things of that ilk. This is a straw, straw god that materialist scientists always attacks. Read books such as The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins. You will, you will see what I mean. This is not the god of esoteric spiritual tradition. This is not the god of Buddhism. This is not the god of even Christianity. Even in Christianity, Jesus said, Kingdom of God is everywhere. He doesn't say that kingdom of God is restricted to a throne, a God sitting on the, in the sky with a wand giving our, doling our judgment and downward causation. So if you don't, if you forget the populist picture of God, if you really consider God as it appears, both transcendent and immanent, as it appears in esoteric tradition, we have rediscovered the meaning of the word transcendent. Transcendence means non-local. We have discovered that God is non-local consciousness. We have discovered what downward causation means. We have discovered that downward causation consists of choice from quantum possibilities. It is this God that the new science is upholding, and we have discovered that subtle bodies exist without any dualism, because subtle bodies, as the material body, all are possibilities of consciousness, and consciousness mediates the interaction of these possibilities as it collapses from these possibilities, its experiences moment to moment. So in this way, we have developed a scientific way of talking about what the spiritual traditions talked about long time ago in language and with the help of only intuition. This is a tremendous accomplishment. If we are not, not so antagonistic to each other, if materialists just sat down for a bit and saw what we are gaining. They are ready to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Yes, religions have given us a lot of evils. Right now, there are so many religious warfare that is going on in the world. I myself are definitely against this kind of abuse of religion. But one should not throw out the basic ideas because of that. One should not get so carried away with one's own emotions. If you sit down quietly and see that there is tremendous wisdom also in the religions. They have always told us, even Islam and even Christianity, the, the warring factions today, even they always talk about virtues, love, beauty, justice. These are the things that religions want us to live. And that part of religion is extremely important. The new science can show that indeed, Evolution is an evolution of consciousness, and what the religions imagine, these virtues coming to earth and people being able to live these virtues, that day is going to come as a part of evolution, and we have a role to play. 
And the sooner we go and fulfill that role, the better. So I'm suggesting quantum activism to people. I'm suggesting that people use the lessons of quantum physics as is being revealed in the new science and use them to transform themselves and the world around them. E, Dr. Amit, quando é que o senhor começou essa sua carreira de propagandista dessas ideias? E depois de escritor, inclusive de livros de autoajuda. Como é que foi isso na sua vida? Well, uh, it was a long time in building. Um, I struggled with the ideas myself. Uh, the ideas didn't gel until it was quite late in my life. I was in my late 50s when, when finally the ideas gelled and I wrote a book called The self Fire Universe. Uh, ever since, it became a little bit easier. Um, ideas started coming in various circumstances, which Carl Jung would call synchronicity. I have always been guided by synchronicity. I have never gotten into any field uh, just by my will or some other kind of motivation. Obviously, nobody who does science in the alternative science has any motivation about money. You cannot get any money doing this kind of thing. So that was never part of the motivation. But it is very strange My that synchronicity has always happened to pull me uh, towards a particular subject. Uh, a biologist at, at Berkeley uh, suddenly invited me to attend an uh, intimate seminar that he was putting together about evolution. I, I didn't even think about evolution until then. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, he forced me to think about evolution. So that's how the work on biological evolution mm -hmm. took place. It's like that. I already shared with you how I got into the researching the soul. The economic uh, thing is the latest interesting thing. There's, a, there's an organization called World Business Academy. Mm -hmm. I got a call from its president one day, and he said, Amit, I want you to become a fellow of this business academy. I said, Rinaldo, I don't know anything about business. I don't know anything even about economics. So why do you want me? He said, no, but you have something to say about the worldview. And we in business need to see the consequence of this worldview to businesses, just as the question I was asked just now. So I said, OK. And the, what's the condition? You have to contribute once in a while. So after a long while, all of a sudden, I had an inspiration that, yes, spiritual economics can be built. I wrote some pages, and I sent it to the editor of their magazine with great hesitation then. What nonsense I'm writing. I'm not an economist. I don't even understand economics properly, I'm sure. So what this editor will say? The editor wrote back, these ideas are extremely interesting. We are going to publish it, to my amazed surprise. So this kind of thing keeps happening in my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Amit, uh, Dr. Amit, por favor. Uh, eu quero colocar, uh, eu discordo profundamente da Mônica, quando ela diz que são livros de autoajuda, eu acho que são livros de eh, divulgação, de, de popularização de um aspecto muito novo da ciência e que precisa, que as pessoas, enfim, eh, pode trazer muita, muita transformação na sociedade. Mas eu queria perguntar ao senhor, dentro desse seu raciocínio que o senhor estava explicando, a sua visão de Deus, como que o senhor vê, vê a criatividade, né? o que é a criatividade, E, e se Deus é a criatividade? Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, God is the originator of all creative ideas. This is why uh, creative people often say that uh, the idea came to me by God's grace. Carl Frederick Gauss said that. The mu mu great musician Brahms said that. Ramindana Tagore, a great poet, said that. Einstein said, I did not discover the theory of relativity by rational thinking alone. Other places he said that uh, he came to trust in God because of his creativity. So it is a common experience of people, this sudden experience that we call creative experience, this aha, this surprise, something completely new. The context of thinking itself changes. That is precisely where the power of downward causation, this quantum freedom of choice, reveals itself. Ordinarily, we become conditioned. So our choice is very muted. Because of the conditioning, we only choose what we have already experienced before, what we have responded before. In creative experiences, nothing of that matters. No conditioning of the past, nothing known matters. It's completely delving into the unknown. 
So we truly get into the power of downward causation of looking at all the possibilities and then choosing that particular gestalt which will be a solution to this problem. Of course we choose in our unconscious. We are not conscious of the choosing process. Cosmic consciousness, God chooses for us. But notice what is happening. God is in the unconscious and I in the ego is dancing with God because that idea, that choice has to be manifested in thought and only ego can manifest it in thought because that's all learned experience that has to enter. So notice how creative people have already described this process in the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel there is a picture by Michelangelo where God and Adam are reaching out to each other. That is the picture of creative process, the flow experience that creativity researchers are discovering. This is what quantum, new quantum science tells us. But notice that it is already intuited in the minds of great creatives like Michelangelo. It's a verification of their work. So what are you waiting for? It's the, the wisdom, the knowledge is already there. The new science is just rediscovering and justifying, giving basis, scientific basis for all the wisdom that already has come before my time. I don't take any credit for it. Nós, nós tentar acabando. Metaforicamente falando, e guardadas as devidas proporções, se o Copérnico voltasse hoje para anunciar o destronamento da Terra, o senhor acha que ele seria aceito incolumemente ou teríamos controvérsias e discussões? Well, you know, you know what happened to Copernicus. For 100 years, uh, nobody listened to any of Copernicus until Galileo took a great amount of risk. Of course, he suffered for it too. Mm -hmm. And, and did something about it. So uh, today, unfortunately, uh, we don't have to go through that. We are not burned at stake for giving radical ideas. And uh, uh, there is more people supporting radical ideas today, just as in this room. I feel that I'm among friends. Even the questions that are being asked that, that sound a little bit uh, difficult, but they're being asked in a very friendly way. So we have achieved this. This is an evolution of consciousness itself. We have evolved since Copernicus. So what I'm saying is that we don't have to wait for a hundred years. Just another couple of decades, the new science will come into its full force. Right now, all we are asking is that call it alternative science just as we are calling alternative methods of medicine, alternative medicine, transpersonal psychology, and alternative psychology. Similarly, let an alternative biology develop. It already is given. That name has already been given by many developmental biologists who don't believe in Darwinism, who believe that development is important in Darwinism, which is what my theory also says. So let alternative science flourish. Eventually, this alternative science, because it is inclusive of the old science, will automatically, effortlessly, become the paradigm of science because experimental data will grow and overwhelm the normal science's objections to these theories. This is the way it always happens. It will happen again. Dr. Han, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Bem, nós uh, queremos agradecer a presença do nosso convidado de hoje. O Roda Viva está chegando aqui ao fim. A presença do físico indiano Amit Goswani, foi o nosso entrevistado de hoje, e também da nossa bancada aqui de entrevistadores. Agradecemos também a sua atenção e a colaboração. E lembrando que o Roda Viva estará de volta na próxima segunda-feira, às 10h40 da noite. Queremos desejar a você uma excelente noite, uma excelente semana e até a próxima segunda. Obrigado pela sua atenção.